The book of Ruth, brethren, relates to the Feast of Pentecost. I love to call it the Feast of First Fruits because that's exactly the character of this holiday. Now, of the five books of the Megillot, Megillot are the festival books that the Jews have from the Bible. The Song of Solomon is read during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Book of Ruth is read during the Feast of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost celebrates the end of the wheat and barley harvest, and the Book of Ruth has a harvest theme. The story takes place during the first fruit harvest of the year, the barley harvest. And, as we understand, God's church represents the first fruits, first fruits harvest in God's plan of salvation for humankind. Now, Ruth was a Gentile and she was married into Israel. And so what we are taught by the story of the book of, is that Gentiles are also going to be a part of God's plan of salvation, that they are going to become Israelites and that they are to be married to Jesus Christ. So Ruth here in the story is a type of the church, Boaz, a type of Jesus Christ. A loose type, but a type nevertheless. And this is the second book in the Megiloth, and it is read at Pentecost by the Jews because of its spring harvest thing. So it is good to study this book, brethren, on this occasion, and to put into our minds the meaning of the Feast of Pentecost. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So this is during the time of the book of Judges, which precedes the Ruth, the book of Ruth. In fact, it was the early period of Judges that seems when the story took place. During the periods of Judges, brethren, Israel had to be chastised by God for their lack of obedience. You may notice the last very verse of the book of Judges, which says that everybody was doing what was right in his own eyes. And then, you know, God would raise when Israel was disobedient, as it always happened in their history of their dwelling in the promised land. God would raise up a judge who would deliver them from their slavery or of their problems. Well, this time there was a famine as a punishment. Remember that we are dealing with Bethlehem here throughout the story. And I mentioned that Boaz would be a type of Jesus Christ because Bethlehem figures throughout the story of Ruth. And that is the place where Naomi returned from Moab. Now, that certain man left the land in a time of famine. That was certainly permitted in the book of Genesis, where we find Abraham going down to Egypt. We also find Isaac going down to Egypt at the time of a famine. We find later on that Jacob came down to Egypt at the time of a famine. But brethren, God had said, after he had brought Israel up, out of Egypt in a great exodus, that they were not to return there again. Now this man was not returning to Egypt, true, but he was leaving Israel, which was now the promised land. Israel had come out of Egypt and entered its promised land, and that is where God intended that they should stay to maintain the inheritance of land that he shall give to them. This man, Elimelech, wanted to escape his responsibilities. Instead of staying there and pleading to God for mercy and forgiveness that God might bring an end to the famine, he decided just to move out of the country. Now, we are going to see, as we explore the story, that the evidence is pretty clear that he was quite a wealthy man. In fact, he was related to Boaz, who was also a very, very wealthy individual. It would seem, and the Bible story brings this out, but also the Jewish commentators, that he left Israel the promised land that God had given to him and to his fathers, because being a rich individual, he didn't want to help out the poor people and the destitute. He got tired of the fact that so many people were poor and were coming to him for help, evidently. And so being fairly prosperous, he decided that he would just move to another country and, in this case, to a Gentile country. Now, we are going to see that, as the result, brethren, of that move, God cursed him. Instead of staying and helping his own people and weathering the situation and praying for God's forgiveness that the famine could end, he just wanted to take care of himself and leave everyone else behind to fend for themselves instead of looking to him for help. Now the name of that man, as we have read, was Elimelech, which means, My God is King. 
It is ironic because God was not his king, because Elimelech was his own king and master. The name of his wife was Naomi, which means the sweet one or the pleasant one. And the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, as we read in Ruth chapter 1 verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Chilion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. Mahlon, brethren, literally means sickness. And Chilion means vanishing. Now these were names given to them either because of the sad plight of Israel at this time being in famine, or as foretelling their early death and childlessness. God cursed the sons as well as the father. All three were going to die as the result of this move, and they would have died childless. The name of his family was to be eradicated from the families of Israel, except for the two women in the family. They went back and things turned out right as the result of their repentance, or Naomi's repentance at least, and God was able to bless and turn from the curse to the blessing. So, verse 3, chapter 1, Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Now, Orpha, brethren, means main, and Ruth means friend, according to the Strong's Concordance. Now, there are some questions regarding these two names by, you know, as they are Moabite names. Bullinger's, for example, Bullinger, the famous commentator Bullinger, says that Ruth's name means beauty, while Orpha's name means hind or fawn. Well, the Jewish commentators, nevertheless, agree with Strong that Ruth's name means friend, which surely makes sense because she became a true friend to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and also a friend of Israel. The Bible talks about those who obey God, brethren, they become friends of God. And that is what Ruth became later on in the story. So they dwelled in Moab about 10 years. Now it is indicated by that account that they had given up all thought of returning back to the promised land. They set out to establish a new life for themselves, away from the poor and the destitute that have been there during the famine. Verse 5, Then both Mahlon and Chilion also died. So the women... That is, sorry, the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Naomi, she survived both her husbands and, uh, and two sons, and now she is a widow. So they were in Moab for about 10 years and married for some of those years to Orpha and to Ruth. And they died both childless. Well, this is not just a coincidence, brethren. Both men died childless. God cursed them in permitting no children to be born of their marriages, and then he gradually also caused both of them to die. Now this parallels us in the church of God. Because brethren, we can choose to get away from God's church, which is a type of the promised land. The promised land was a type of the church, that is. The promised land was also actually the type of the kingdom of God, but the church of God is the kingdom of God in embryo. So we can choose to get away from God's church because of the responsibilities that are upon us as being members of the church of God. Such are those who got tired of the tithing system, for example, and helping the poor of this world and the spiritually destitute. They got tired of paying back to God and there are those who decided to go back to the world and forget about the tithing system altogether. You know, we had what we called co-workers in the 20th century. We have nowadays people who are just reading our materials and stuff, but they're not really fully committed. And we have those who have decided basically to leave the church and go back to the world, brethren. And for a period of time, they might prosper because remember, there was a 10-year period that this family stayed in Moab. But the day will come when they will lose everything. And if they do not repent, they would die. If they're still alive, they will die in the Great Tribulation. We cannot escape the responsibility to which we are called, brethren. We can go back to the world, and Satan can bless us for a period of time, yes, by inspiring us to keep out of the church, and that is why people go out, and uh, that will improve their financial conditions. However, Satan also blesses, brethren, keep that in mind. And why not? He is the God of this world, so he has the power to do it, brethren. Remember, he offered blessings to Jesus Christ. 
where he was tempting Jesus Christ. He showed him all the riches of the world and said, These will I give you if you fall down and obey me. Now Christ did not deny that those riches were Satan's to give. Because Satan can bless in this world. If someone wants to go out of the church, Satan can keep him or her out because money is what they want. He is more than happy to give it to them just to keep them out of the church. Now, of course, when the Great Tribulation comes and economy gets shattered, then they will lose everything. And those who live, live in the Anglo-Saxon nations, those who left the church, they will lose everything even before the Great Tribulation, even before the Great Tribulation strikes their nations, because, brethren, remember the prophecy. There will be a siege, as Prophet Ezekiel describes it in his book. A siege of the Anglo-Saxon world. What does that mean? Well, the United States of Europe are going to eventually impose the economic sanctions on those Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Saxon nations, which, coupled with the prophesied famine in the land, will destroy the economic fabric of your societies and will bring you to an economic ruin. And those people, you know, who have left the church, they cannot go to the place of safety. But this man, Elimelech, he saw his place of safety in the world, and it was actually not the place of safety. He lost everything. Verse 6, Then she arose, Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So the famine was now over. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now, brethren, in our countries, departing from relatives takes place in the house. You know, you just come to each other, each other's home, and uh, when you leave, or you just, you know, part at the door. But in Orient, it wasn't so. In Orient, you walked a certain distance with the people of the way. And then, when you are a few miles or a few kilometers away from home, that is when you would say goodbye to them. In other words, you would escort them a part of the distance. So that's why she went out from the place with her two daughters-in-law with her. Verse 8, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Because, you know, when her two sons were alive, they were evidently good wives to them. The Lord grant you that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Well, Brandy Naomi was a good mother-in-law. She considered their welfare before her own. A lot of times, of course, mothers-in-law become very possessive of their sons and daughters, and they interfere with marriages and relationship of two spouses, or try to selfishly hold on to the affection of the younger generation. But yet Naomi was willing to have them leave her so that they could find greater happiness than she thought they can have with her. And she goes on to show why. So she was saying to them, go back and you can find other husbands in your own people and this would be better for you. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Verse 10, and they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters, why would you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Well, Benjamin, by this time she was certainly beyond the age of childbearing, and she lost her husband. And growing older, she was unlikely to be married again. Verse 12, turn back my daughters. Well, now notice what she says to the two girls. She tells them, count the cost. These two girls, brethren, were on their way in type to the promised land, to the kingdom of God, in type. Just as us, before we get baptized, we are called upon to count the cost. There will be cost we have to sustain on our road to the kingdom of God. Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband, if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? There are indications that Ruth at that time was 40, so brethren Naomi would be about 60 years old. So she may have been speaking just metaphorically here. And even if she gave birth to sons, for them to grow it would take another 20 years. Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. 
It grieves me very much for your own sakes. Naomi cared about them. And the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She saw that the family had been cursed by God for this move away from their responsibility. Just like somebody quitting God's church. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now Orpha, brethren, is a type of those of the many called and few chosen. She had a calling here to the kingdom of God and she went part of the distance. She left the home in Moab and she walked part of the distance on the way to the promised land of the world to come, as the kingdom of God is called by Paul in Hebrews. But by the way, brethren, she counted the cost. So she figured, you know, she figured out it was better to go back into the world. And there are those whom we traditionally called co-workers, as I said, prospective members, that expressed some interest in the truth or still express it. But, you know, they're willing to go just a certain distance. But they're not willing to go all the way. All the way of the Lord, of course. When I say the way, I mean the Lord. The way of the Lord, the way. The true religion in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is called by no other name but the way. ha Derek, The way. The way of life, brethren. The way of conduct. So Orpha is a type of those people. They are in contact with the truth. They believe it, but they only go a certain distance though. Now Ruth is the type of those who are willing to go all the way. Naomi was concerned for them as much as Ruth was concerned for her. So verse 15, Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods, which indicates that Orpha had given up her gods when she came to live in Elimelech's household. But now she was leaving a home of Israelites and going back to her Gentile people and, in consequence, to her gods. And that is the way with people who leave the Church of God, brethren. They go back into the world and they begin to seek the values of this world. Return after your sister-in-law. Verse 16. Now here come two very famous verses in your Western world. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. In a sense, brethren, it's almost like a marriage covenant. Well, this was daughter-in-law and mother-in-law, but uh, you can almost read it for husbands and wives. Wherever you go, I'll go, and wherever you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I'll die, and there will I be buried. The Lord so do to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And marriage certainly is until death do us part. But this was not a husband and a wife, so these words could not have been taken in effect of that. Here was an act of loyalty to a widow and to a mother-in-law. And a lot, of t you know, a lot of time, brethren, in this world, there is no that kind of relationship with mothers-in-law. We all know very well, in our society here, as much as, I guess, in your societies, wherever you are, we all know very well that mothers-in-law have gained quite a reputation. Verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. And Ruth was, brethren, steadfastly minded to go with her. Now notice the character here of the Ruth. The character of Ruth, a woman should have a right kind of determination and resolve. And woman, yes, she may be the weaker vessel as far as physical strength is concerned. That's what the Bible gives us as an indication. But nevertheless, brethren... A woman should not be weak-willed. Yes, soft and gentle, but not soft in the head or weak-willed. Verse 19. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. Now the expression here in the Hebrew, the two of them, indicates that both now are to be considered equal and demonstrates how precious a sincere proselyte is in the sight of God. 
So they, too, now went as equal spiritually. Now, of course, they were not equal in rank, in the sense that mother-in-law should be the one in authority to a certain extent because of her age. But spiritually now, brethren, because Ruth was a sincere proselyte, they were considered spiritually equal. Now, it, and it happened, it says, it happened when they had come to Bethlehem, which means the house of bread in Hebrew, that all the city was excited because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? A total contrast here with what they had seen ten years earlier. This family had left in a great wealth because Elimelech, brethren, was a mighty man, as it says in King James. In fact, he was a descendant, it would seem, of a prince of Judah. His background was noble. He was a descendant of a prince of Judah and Boaz also, because they were of the line of Pharis, as we are going to see. And from that line, brethren, or from the marriage of Ruth and Boaz, not only came David, famous King David, but also, of course, Jesus Christ himself. So, you know, the locals, they were amazed at what they saw. Their surprise was elicited by the tragic reversal of fortunes here that struck the inhabitants immediately. Here was an old woman, weary and worn, bearing the marks of sorrow and suffering. Could this be the wealthy lady that had left them? And perhaps the lady of some disposition, because Naomi was a very fine person, as far as we can tell. Well, that was not the person that they had known a decade ago. It was totally different from the way they had seen them leave. Here she came back without her husband, without her both sons, without any grandchildren, and with a proselyte Gentile. Verse 20, But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Brethren, God cursed her, so what should we do? Well, now she followed her husband, and God let her live for her submission she was Naomi was obviously a woman following the way so being obedient to her husband as the Bible commands good wives to be that's exactly what she did and that's certainly why God spared her and her life but nevertheless he cursed the husband and he cursed her two sons remaining because evidently when her husband died the two sons didn't say let us return to our land no, brethren, they wanted to stay in Moab too, in a foreign land, in a Gentile land. Verse 21, Naomi continues, I went out full, indicating abundance of wealth, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. So, brethren, she went out with wealth, blessed with a husband and family, and came back empty, widowed, and childless. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Well, testified against me for emigrating from the promised land that he gave to our fathers, emigrating to Moab. So, verse 22, so Naomi returned and ruled the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. And there is about three months, brethren, period here. In the spring that the barley harvest was to, la was to last and so the whole story this whole story is during the spring harvest the type of the first fruits and Ruth as we have we said earlier was a type of the first fruits of the Gentiles to be brought into God's church we've been talking a lot lately about the number of Gentiles that are to enter in well brethren here is the representative the type of all of those and at the same time, the type of the entire church, of the first fruits. But notice also, brethren, yes, Ruth was a Gentile, but in order to be a part of living in the promised land, and a part of God's blessings, a part of the first fruits, Ruth had to become a physical Israelite if she was going to be married to an Israelite. In God's law, God made it possible for Gentiles to marry Israelites. He made it possible, but he also allowed for such a marriage if a Gentile party was to become Israelite. So, Gentiles today, by extension, if they want to become a part of the first fruits of God's church, they have to become spiritual Israelites, as it is often called. 
However, I prefer, which I think is biblically more accurate to say, that they have to become Israelites led by the Spirit of God. Now, it is not for those who are physical Israelites that they are any better than those members who are of Gentile origin, brethren. In fact, as we know from the Bible, many Gentiles, those who are Gentile of origin, who are converted and are now Spirit-led Israel, will be ruling over the physical Israelites in the Kingdom of God. But nevertheless, in order to be a part of the first fruits, we have to become, as it is often called again, spiritual Israelites, and I prefer to say spirit-led Israelites. Remember, brethren, the end of the book says that we win indeed, but the end of the book, the book of the Bible, the Bible, the book of books, in the end, we read that New Jerusalem will have 12 gates. And over the gates are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Where are the Gentiles? Well, I explained that in my sermon about the two covenants, brethren. Where are the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles are grafted into Israel and they become Israelites. Israel as a whole is the bride of Jesus Christ because covenant is a marriage. And as I explained to you in the Old and the New Covenant, brethren, in that sermon, I clearly said that God is monogamous. He had only one wife, not many multiple wives. His wife in the Old Covenant was the house of Israel, brethren. His wife under the New Covenant as well is only one. It will be Israel. Because all the nations, as Paul explains in Romans, that great mystery, all the nations will be grafted into Israel. So, Israel as a whole is the bride of Jesus Christ. So, everyone becomes an Israelite because these promises were, the promises we are claiming even under the new covenant were made to who to abraham brethren and those who were gentiles before their conversion are not anymore gentiles in god's church their spirit led israelites in his sight equal to any and equal of any physical israelites who are con who are converted because you know in god's sight there is neither jew nor gentile etc etc as it says in romans chapter 2 verse 1 there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Now, brethren, we notice too that this man was a mighty man, as it says in King James. He was a wealthy individual, indicating that Elimelech had been also a wealthy individual. Elimelech was of the same origin, of the same noble family, and a man who was very wealthy. The name Boaz possibly means strength. Now, there are some questions as to the meaning of the name, but he certainly was strong in character and was a type of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ was perfect in character, strong, and Ruth, being friendship, became a friend of God, as each of us is a friend of God if we obey him. Now, there is a rabbinic tradition that Elimelech and Boaz were descended from Nashon, who was a prince of the tribe of Judah, mentioned in Numbers chapter 1, verse 7. I'll read that for you. It's only mentioned by name. It says, Numbers 1, 7, from Judah, Nashon, the son of Aminadab. And that's about it. So that would indicate again that they were very wealthy. Verse 2, chapter 2 of the book of Ruth, verse 2. So Ruth the Moabites said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. Now, brethren, you can jot down this. There are the laws in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 24. And when I say jot down, yes, take notes always and uh, at least try to glean out of any sermon whatever is useful and good that can be mindful that you can go over later and draw even more during your personal Bible study. So in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 24, this is Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 24, 22 and Leviticus 19 verse 9 and 10 whatever harvest is left of a value in the fields vineyards or, or, or the orchards could be claimed by the poor strangers or a widow now they could go and glean the corners of the fields whatever was left of the harvest poor could go in to those fields which were not their property and pick up what was dropped and remained of the harvest it was one of the pre provisions God had made in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And I'll just read what I told you. It's Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10. 
It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And as I told you, brethren, yesterday, during the weekly Sabbath service, this same law in the Spirit applies to us. And I, 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 I encourage you not to be stingy. I encourage you, in fact, to follow this law. Be generous. And as a good example, I've take, I had taken yesterday, I had mentioned American culture, which is very well known for its generosity. But unfortunately, in the physical Israel today, America is rather exception rather than the rule. I also mentioned to you yesterday, parts of the House of Israel, modern House of Israel today, which, which are those who are very known for their stinginess. We as the followers of Christ are not to be stingy, brethren. This law in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 24 applies to us today in spirit. And verse 2, uh, Naomi, and she, said to, she says to Ruth, Go, my daughter. Verse 3. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now it says, of course, that she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, brethren. However, nothing happened by a chance. There is no coincidence here. And we should understand that by the rest of the story. God was working this out. Some things, brethren, seem to be coincidence in our lives, but it is God guiding our lives for us. And God here was guiding the line which will one day bear Jesus Christ. Verse 4. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Indicating here, brethren, that Boaz was a religious man, and obviously not all Israelites were. Keep in mind the end of the book of Judges. Everybody was doing what was right in his or her own eyes. But what a wonderful employee, employer here, you know. The Lord be with you. And all of his employees respond, The Lord bless you. Well, if you're ever to be an employer, here is the attitude for you and me. And if we are ever to be employees, and we are, we are nevertheless to have this response, even to those who are not employers like Boaz was, because, you know, we are told to pray for our enemies and those who spitefully use us, and so on. Verse 5, Then Boaz said, because he notices right away something is new in his field, he said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? Verse 6, and they have this repetition, you know, because we already read it. It's servant who was in charge of the reapers, so it's clear to us. But verse 6 says, So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Repetition, brethren. Yes, we often joke that uh, those repetitions were put in the Bible for the sake of the tribe of Manasseh, because Manasseh also has an endless set of questions why and how come? Did you mean? Did you want to say? Uh, are you saying? And so on. Well, I would say it's not only for Manasseh's sake. All these repetitions are here for our sakes as well because we're all very forgetful. So anyway, he tells Boaz who this young lady was. And of course, he knew that he was related to that family. Uh, and by the way, according to the Jewish Midrash, Ruth was about 40 years of age, so as I mentioned, Naomi was probably about 60. And according to Midrash, again, Boaz was 80 years old. So this was a late-life marriage. But and of course, we should, we should question whether he was really 80. Because, you know, Ruth could have been really 40, but knowing that women married a lot earlier back then, perhaps 10 years less than that, and she might have been about 30. According to the Midrash, which is not, again, an oracle of God, and it's not the infallible authority, but I'm just mentioning this to you as a, in a comment. It's an interesting comment. So according to Midrash, again, they say Ruth was about 40 and Boaz was 80. But in any case, we will wait for the resurrection and uh, when we become the first fruits of salvation, finally, we are born, when we are born into the family of God, then we will then know the answer to that question. However, it's very certain, what we see from the content of this book, that Boaz was, uh, you know, much older than Ruth. Verse 7, and she said, now he's quoting the, uh, this uh, servant who was in charge of the reapers, he's quoting now Ruth, 
And she said, Please let me glean and gather out the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. So here again, brother, we, we see some of the character of Ruth. We see her loyalty to her mother-in-law, first of all in chapter 1. Now we see in chapter 2, her character that she was a hard worker. Now apparently she was working in that field from the morning, except for a few moments of break when she rested in the shade. And I told you yesterday, when we spoke, talked about the knowing of God, knowledge of God and Ruth, I told you and said that it wasn't really... Uh, you know, gleaning the field was not an easy work to do. It meant that you were to be bent, you know, while you're running here, running there, picking up from here, picking up from there, and so on. Verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Again, those are all Hebrew idiomatic expressions. Do not go to glean in another field, not, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And brethren, undoubtedly, there was a danger for a young girl going into the field, gleaning and reaping, and there were young men, that they would be bothered, you know. There was a good chance that those young women would be bothered by those men. Now, sadly, sadly, I say, because this was supposed to be, these people are supposed to be God's people, observing God's commandments. Sadly, there was a danger that someone would have suffered a rape. And keep in mind again, Brandon, that all, not all Israelites were religious. In fact, it is a good chance that most of them were irreligious and that many of them did not mind the law of God, let alone obey it. And Boaz continues, when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. And after we finish reading chapter 3, we will mention 10 acts of kindnesses that Boaz showed to Ruth. There, there are brethren 10 little things here, little kindnesses that he performed. Verse 10. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz gave her an answer. However, brethren, when it says here in verse 11 that he answered, the Hebrew signifies signifies the raising of the voice here. In other words, he spoke for all to hear. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Brethren, this is a type, a person, of a, it is a type of a person coming into the church of God, into this very church of the first fruits of God's salvation. Because it says all, Boaz said, all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. Now I mentioned yesterday and I'll repeat today that uh, a woman is a symbol of the church in the Bible. So she left everything that was following her mother-in-law while she put the fur on the first place in her life the church. She put the church first symbolically, of course, brethren, because there wasn't the church of God at this point, you know, in, in the Old Testament, but she put the first church, the church first and she left the world behind. Because Boaz says, how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before, as was the case when we entered the church of God. We left the world behind and we came to a fellowship made up of people that we knew not before. People who were all strangers to us. Well, brethren, the same happened later in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, the Apostle Peter says to Jesus Christ, Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Now Ruth forsook everything, all. She came with nothing into the promised land, symbolically into the church. Because we also had to forsake all coming up into the, into the church. In a sense, of course, we're not forsaking everything and everybody, brethren. It means we are forsaking all in a sense of forsaking anything that stood in the way of us obeying God. That's what it means. Verse 28 in Matthew 19. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration... When the Son of Man 
or in the restoration of all things, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. As I mentioned a million times, brethren, I will co co continue pounding that truth. The kingdom of God at the same time will be the kingdom of restored Israel. The remnant of Israel, the remnant of twelve tribes after the great tribulation and after the day of the Lord at Christ's coming, at Christ's return, the remnant is going to return to its own land. And for the first time and finally, Israel will be what it should have been all the time. The model nation to which other nations will be able to look up to and would want to follow as indicated in Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And who is Jacob? He is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, brethren. All the world, all the nations will want to follow God of Israel, God of Jacob, because Israel will be the model nation to lead them and be the light to the true God. And as you noticed, there will be twelve thrones, thrones, and twelve apostles will be judging each one tribe of Israel. Again, Israel is there all the time, prominently figuring everywhere, brethren. And nobody has a right to say, oh, we are under the new covenant, so therefore, who cares about Old Testament Israel? What does that have to do with us? It has to do everything with us. Because Israel is an inseparable part of God's plan of salvation. And again, we all are to be grafted into Israel, so whoever turns to God of Israel automatically becomes spirit-led Israelite. And all the nations, as Paul explains, well, you can go in, in, in Romans and read chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, especially chapter 11 in Romans, he speaks about the mystery, he says, and he reveals to us the mystery. The mystery is that all nations will be grafted into Israel, will be, brethren, with absolute, said with absolute authority. And then in verse 29, Jesus Christ continues and tell, speaks to his apostles, to his disciples, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake. Of course, it doesn't mean we're deserting the world, by the way. It means, brethren, whoever stands on our way of, you know, in our way of serving God, we do not follow that. We do not follow the authority of our brothers and our sisters and our parents who do not serve God, who do not want to serve God. We just don't obey their authority. We're no longer obligated, you know, to obey anything from this world, including our closest relatives. We are obligated to follow what God commands. So whoever does, you know, forsake all that shall receive a hundredfold and in inherit eternal life. Well, brethren, Ruth was such a person. And we are also, we have all kinds of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters that we never had in this world. We have them now, where? In the church of God. And in verse 30 of Matthew 19, But many who are first will be last, and the last first. That's what Jesus Christ said. Well, this is what Ruth is a type of, brethren. She is a type of the church of God, the first fruits, and being a Gentile, she signifies that a Gentile has to become a spirit-led Israelite, just as she became a proselyte of the land of Israel. We are back in chapter 2 of the book of Ruth, verse 12. Boaz says to Ruth, The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord of God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Again, here it is, God of Israel. And as I mentioned many times, brethren, we are not ashamed. No matter of our ethnic origin, we are not ashamed to be servants of the God of Israel. God of Jacob, the father of twelve tribes of Israel. Under whose wings you have come. A Gentile woman had come under the wings of the God of Israel. And of course, by turning to God for help and turning to God to serve him, she becomes led by that God. She becomes Israelite, spiritual Israelite here in the Old Covenant, brethren. Just as we trust, you know, under the wings of God that shelters and protects us and will take us to the place of safety if we are faithful. Verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. My Lord, she tells him. Well, again, he is a prototype. He is a type of Jesus Christ. 
Again, brethren, we see from verse 13 the humility here, the humility of this woman Ruth, which is displayed before our eyes. Loyalty, hard work and diligence, humility. We might say a virtuous, perfect woman described in Proverbs chapter 31. Verse 14. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Of course, we understand why she kept some back. For her mother-in-law, you see. Now the Hebrew word for vinegar here is chometz, with that ch sound, which is not very common in the Anglo-Saxon world. Chometz, it denotes an acid beverage, brethren, probably apple cider vinegar or sour wine, which is mixed with a little oil. And it was an oriental, oriental drink, which is probably still popular today and apparently very refreshing, because... In Adam Clark's commentary, I found an explanation that it is some refreshing kind of acid sauce used by the reapers to dip their bread in, which both cooled and refreshed them. Vinegar, rob of fruits, etc. are used for this purpose in the East to the present day, and the custom of the Arabs is to dip the bread and hand together into these cooling and refreshing articles. End of the quote. So in hot weather, brethren, it is said that this vinegar is particularly beneficial, quenching thirst, cooling the body, toning up digestive system. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's the case with apple cider vinegar, because it is very healthy for humans. And uh, when it comes to digestive system, it's very healthy for digestive system in general for all the humans. But even for some domestic animals, brethren, believe it or not, the recommendation for cats is to add them a droplet of apple cider vinegar in their water that that will help their digestive system i've been doing that for some time and yes it does show great results verse 15 and when she rose up to glean boaz commanded by his young men saying let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her so he was just more than gleaning on the corners of the field because ruth now could get in the middle if she wanted among the sheaves also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Now, brethren, Boaz had no ulterior motive here. Yes, true, he married Ruth later on, but he was not planning marriage at this point because he was the next in line, next to kin to the one to marry her. Plus, he was a much older man, as I said, so he wasn't expecting that she would be taken with him or fall for him. Yet, brethren, these acts of kindnesses counted very much with Ruth. You see, she had gotten taken pretty quick with them. Or she was falling for them. I'm saying this falling for. I was counseling recently a nice lady for baptism. And uh, she was explaining to me a lovely story how she met her future husband and... Uh, then she said, oh, and then we were just falling for one another. Well, that's exactly what's happening here, obviously, with Ruth in relation with Boaz, even though he's not aware of that because, you know, here is a much younger woman. He, he would expect her to be chasing after young, younger men, rich men, you know. He probably didn't even, didn't even, has, didn't, hadn't even occurred to him that she would, she would ask him to be her redeemer. There was this institution of redeemer, brethren, in the Bible. But nevertheless, you know, these acts of kindness counted very much with Ruth. And this was just, you know, generosity, however, on his part. There, were no, there was no ulterior motive. And, you know, he didn't tell her that he was doing this. He said it quietly to, this, you know, to his men, just as when it is possible, brethren, when it is possible to keep our generosity unknown, we are to do so because Jesus Christ says in Matthew 6, I'll remind you, he says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise... You have no reward from your Father in heaven. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't let anyone see your generosity. Sometimes, of course, we can't help it. But if it can be done privately, it should be, brethren. That's the point. So this is what Boaz did for Ruth without her knowing. Verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening. 
and beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley now according to the jewish commentary you know brethren this was probably enough to support ruth and naomi nearly for a week the bible story says it was a gallon or or ephah enough to make many loaves of bread and i'll have to again remind you i said loaves of bread the jewish culture just like serbian culture today just like the french culture today as well is consuming a lot of bread brethren it's not small small little thin slices that i've seen in the west no brethren the bread our daily bread give us our what does it say give us our daily bread every every day he doesn't say give us our little slices thin slices of bread every day no brethren it's daily bread it's eaten consumed by loaves in some cultures today including jewish culture we understand that here because we here in this culture have grown up on bread brethren bread is the main staple without bread even when we describe food in general we say bread meaning our daily sustenance serbian people cannot imagine life without bread probably the, that's the case with some other people of the balkan peninsula well with south slavic people more, more or less and as i said that's the case in in the french culture as far as i know and also in the jewish culture you know it was bread was consumed in loaves that's why i say it was enough as the jewish commentary says it was enough to make many loaves of bread bread loaves of bread verse 18 then she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied that's some of those things that she kept aside for her verse 19 and her mother-in-law of course her mother-in-law realizes that this is impossible without having a special help she certainly knew what a gleaning you know for a day would 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 bring what would be the results of a one day gleaning on the field said to her where have you gleaned today and where did you work blessed be the one who took notice of you in other words there is no way you know you have made this pile of barley without somebody giving you some special help so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said the man's name with whom i work today is boaz now brethren here we just watch naomi and we see the matchmaking mentality she immediately began to roll the wheels in her mind verse 20 then naomi said to her daughter-in-law blessed be he of the lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead the dead for he was caring for the widow and naomi said to her you know what something ruth this man is a relation of ours one of our close relatives now brethren i mentioned about the uh, institute institution of redeemer in the bible well kinsmen you know kinsmen had both rights and duties in the old testament law the right to buy property of his dead relative before it was offered for public sale he was also you know the kinsman whether it will be brother or the next in line of uh, next kinsman in line was the avenger of blood and the avenger of murder and it was also his duty to redeem his relative who sold himself as a slave but also there was a law in the old testament that if a brother or one near kin died childless then the next kinsman or as it has been put in the hebrew here one that has the right to redeem could marry the widow by this law of god to raise up seed to the dead husband so that the name of that certain family would not be eradicated in israel that was the law in the old testament so naomi was thinking here hey guess what ruth by this law of god if this man is willing he can be your husband now it seems from verse 21 that ruth wasn't really much opposed to that idea because she says ruth the moabite said he also said to me you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest in other words he wanted her to stay in his field alone because he wanted to provide for her because he had heard of her good character and also because he wanted to provide for both widows because naomi because she was related and ruth because she was her daughter-in-law and also a widow again a godly man who knows the 
you know, the law of God, brethren, and was living it, living it out, practicing the law of God. And as I mentioned in my, in, uh, in my sermon, Why the Church, brethren, it's not enough that we know the law of God. We have to practice. It's not enough that we have the Spirit of God, brethren. We have to be led by the Spirit of God. And yes, you'll say, but it will make us ridiculous. It will bring, uh, bring ridicule, uh, scorn upon us. Yes, indeed, brethren. That's the cost we have to count before becoming followers of Christ. We have to count on, 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 you know, on that, that we'll be as sheep for slaughter daily for his own sake. We have to count on ridicule, that people will be ridiculing us as they did Noah, for example, who was building the ark on the land, by the way. Building ark, and there was no rain at all. He was building ark on the land. You know, what, a, what an attraction in the Middle East. Here is somebody, you know, building an ark. What for? You can just imagine 120 years of ridicule that he sustained. Brethren, that's all part of counting the cost. And we must not be afraid of the world around us. We must not be afraid, brethren. Greater is the one who has conquered the death, who has conquered the world. And we are his followers. We are the followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we are called Christians. And then verse 22 so Boaz lived out what he knew. He knew what the law of God says about taking care of widows and gleaning the fields. And he even made provisions so that obviously these two ladies would be able to store up food for the whole, for the entirety of the winter. He realized that <coughs> Naomi remained without anything. No longer was there wealth there to sustain her. And Naomi, verse 22, said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with, this young, with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. Yes, it's good, of course. You could be raped in any other field. Because it's time of judges when everybody's doing what is right in his or own, her own eyes. And I could, just, I could just presume, brethren, as probably you can presume with me, even if there were some offenses against the law of God, there was no way that perhaps those who violated the law of God would be sanctioned or prevented from violating it. Because everybody was doing what was right in his own eyes. So Ruth, basically, Naomi said to Ruth, well, maybe something more would come of this. And she probably counted something more would come of this because she realized, I would presume again, there will be the end of harvest. And uh, at the end of harvest, something might happen. Verse 23, so she stayed, Ruth stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? What did she mean with, shall I not seek security? Or, as it says in King James, rest. Rest for you, brethren. Shall I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Well, in chapter 1, verse 9, we read, as Naomi told her daughter-in-law to go back home, she said, The Lord grant you that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Rest, security, safety. Well, her concept was, why would I go hunt? Why would I, you know, why would I not go hunting for husband for you, Ruth? And make a few suggestions here. Shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now, brethren, Naomi wanted to play now a matchmaker. No wonder. And you might remember how it was. There's that funny song, Matchmaker, you know, in the Fiddler on the Roof. So it's something of that kind. But nevertheless, it wasn't so, <laughs> it wasn't so silly as it was portrayed in the Fiddler on the Roof. Here is a woman, Naomi, who was a woman knowing God, knowing the law of God. So she was doing everything according to the law of God. She didn't violate the law of God in any way. There was this institution of a kinsman redeemer, and she was going to use that one if Ruth was willing. Ruth was willing, nevertheless. So Naomi wanted to see another wedding. Notice Naomi's unselfish concern because as her mother-in-law, brethren, she could have just wanted to keep Ruth to herself in her own household, but she preferred to see Ruth married. She wanted Ruth's best interest kept at heart. Verse 2, now Boaz, whose young women you were with, 
Is he not a relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Oh, there we are. So notice now that the plot thickens, brethren. This little, you know, there is a little conspiracy going on here. A matchmaking plan. A matchmaking plan. So, she obviously knew that he would be, you know, there on the, uh, on, on, on his, uh, was the what, what on, on his uh, winnowing uh, uh, threshing floor that is she obviously knew that he would be you know winnowing the barley so the plot thicken, thickens and also brethren Boaz was as we see a man of wealth but we notice that he assisted personally in his work he wasn't above getting his fingers dirty and no wonder brethren we should have the same mentality so verse 3 therefore Naomi says, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So, you know, get dressed up for him to see your personal appearance and you have to sneak in there. You see, it was all done very sneakily, brethren. Verse 4 then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in uncover his feet and lie down and you will t and he will tell you what you should do now brethren to uncover his feet <laughs> it's strange to us of course today well that meant to draw the blanket that he was sleeping under and lay it upon herself and you may wonder what in the world is this well brethren was a man put his garment on a woman in the old testament it was symbolic of a marriage proposal in that culture you see and here ruth was going to take his blanket and put it on herself as we'll see in verse 9 in fact let us drop to verse 9 and read the last part of it which says take your maidservant under your wing for you are a close relative taking under a wing king james is perhaps a better translation he says spread therefore thy skirt or thy garment over thine handmaid for thou art a near kinsman well brethren first of all she uncovered his feet and he had a blanket over his feet and laid there that was a type of her proposing to him and then asking him to take his skirt or his garment and to put it over her was for him to accept her marriage proposal. So we have an example of God doing this with Israel in Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 8. God says of Israel when Israel came out of Egypt. Go jump to Ezekiel and keep your fingers in, in the book of Ruth. God says when I passed by you again and looked upon you indeed your time was the time of love. This is referring to Israel in Egypt. So here is God as a lover and he makes a proposal to her the marriage which took place on the day of pentecost on this very day that you are we are celebrating brethren that was the marriage the old covenant was 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 uh, made and also the law of god was given to god's people by that act of giving the law of god the proposal for the marriage the uh, rules in the marriage god made covenant and had married and married israel that's also the meaning of this day. So Israel was engaged to God after the Feast of Unleavened Bread when they left Egypt. And then on the day of Pentecost, they became married. That is exactly what is to take place later with us as the first fruits, brethren, as we are to be married to Jesus Christ, who is, by the way, the God of the Old Testament, which is explained in my sermon about God of the Old Testament. Ezekiel continues quoting God. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a marriage covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord. So this is what Naomi was counseling Ruth to do, brethren, on this particular evening. And Ruth was willing. Evidently, she was quite taken with Boaz or, as we would say in our modern language, she had fallen for Boaz pretty much. Ezekiel 16, chapter 16, verse 5. Uh, sorry, we have read uh, verse 8 in Ezekiel. Let's go back to the uh, book of Ruth. We're in chapter 3, verse 5. And she said to her, to her mother-in-law, All that you said to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. Now, brethren, undoubtedly Ruth 
may have wanted to chicken out at some point. Well, this was quite a bold move for a girl to make, right? Now, she had the right to propose to him in this way, but also she knew she was risking getting rejected and there must have been times when she wondered, well, should I do this? Should I not? But she obeyed the counsel and advice of her mother-in-law, brethren. She did all that her mother-in-law instructed her to do. In the Old Testament law, it was the duty of the nearest eligible male kin of a dead husband to marry a widow in the event she had no children, so she may, might have opportunity to have an offspring through the family that had chosen her. And this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. You can just jot it down and read it later. Verse 7. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, well, probably, you know, this was a celebration at, of the end of the harvest, so he was very happy. The harvest was obviously bountiful. There is a reference to it ending in the latter part of chapter 2, which says he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Oh boy, she came softly. Notice she sneaked in there, so that nobody would see or hear. She uncovered his feet. Hopefully he had taken his socks off before going to bed. And she laid down. Verse 8. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled. Well, better no wonder he was startled. No wonder he was afraid. The poor guy was sleeping and all of a sudden he felt that warm body. How could he know it was a human being, you know? You know, it could have been a snake or porcupine. It could have been a skunk or whatever. So no wonder, Brennan, he was startled because it is a scary situation. He was afraid not knowing what kind of animal had decided to use his feet for its body warmth. <laughs> and turned himself and there a woman was lying at his feet. Well, by the way, Brennan, we are not teaching nor recommending that women would do this in the Church of God. We are having different customs today and we stick with them because this would not be understood in the modern 21st century. In any way, startled Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night, verse 9, and he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. So she had made a marriage proposal to him by getting under his blanket at his feet. She was asking him to accept the proposal by spreading his garment over her, as it was the case in the Old Testament, brethren. It was a marriage proposal. Verse 10. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, which again, brethren, teaches us that Boaz was an older man, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman now of course brethren if another woman had done this if she had been of a lesser reputation it would have been misconstrued but now regardless you know he did keep it secret so that there would be no falsifying of her reputation but the entire city knew that she was a virtuous woman and he knew then that she did this in virtue not out of an attempt to seduce him that night verse 12 now it is true that i am a close relative however there is a relative closer than i well now here came a real shocker and blow to ruth brethren we can imagine how her face blushed red at this point she turned right red she proposed to the wrong man now, this was the right man, the man she loved, of course. But unfortunately, there was someone else who, if the law was to be followed, had the right first to marry her. Verse 13. Stay this night and in the morning it shall be that if he'll perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I'll perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So she lay at her at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Now, of course, back in those days there was no street there was no street lives lights, there was no you know public light system, so 
Nobody could recognize that she was back to the town. Nobody could recognize it was her. So Ruth rose up very, very early in the morning, brethren, so that there would be no sexual temptation, temptation here. Boaz said to God and possibly to Ruth also, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. He wanted to protect her reputation and probably pray to God that it would not be discovered. Verse 15. Also he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Well, now, brethren, that's a dumb question at this stage of the game. Of course, it's, it's Ruth. Who else could it be? But this is actually, in Hebrew, it is an idiomatic expression, as the Revised Standard Version puts it. It should really be translated as, How did you fare? How did, it, how did, how did the whole thing go? Well, you know, probably Naomi didn't sleep the whole night. She was probably by now chewing her finger, you know, wondering how everything was going. And Ruth probably didn't sleep all night either when she found out that Boaz was not the next of kin, that she had proposed to the wrong man. So she had proposed to the right one, of course, as we understand, but she must have been feeling, oh no, what have I done? And she was probably praying to that, you know, uh, that closer relative would say no. And that she would get the man she loved, Boaz. Then she told her all that the man had done for her. Verse 17. And she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter. <laughs> well, it's easy to say, sit still. You know, we can bet that Ruth had a hard time sitting still all day long. It was a sound advice, brethren, but we can just imagine her sitting at the edge of the, her chair that she'll, she was sitting still, you know, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Now we notice something about Boaz's character, brethren. Here he was not a procrastinator, unlike many of us. Of course, he was in love and, you know, love knows no patience. But when it, when it is in a courting stages, I guess it wants to get things moving generally. <laughs> and I promise you that we will, we will review 10 acts of kindnesses after we read chapter 3. Well, little acts of charity by Boaz, verse 8 of chapter 2. Then Boaz said, Truth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. That is the first act of kindness. Stay here with mine. Second, verse 9. Here, have I not commanded the young man not to touch you? I've given the young guys here a special warning. Hands off. Second act of kindness. Protection for her. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Third act of kindness, brethren, you don't even have to bring your own water. You go drink of the water we have got. Verse 14. Now Boaz said to her all at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. You don't have to eat at the side of the field. That was the fourth act of kindness. You come right here and eat with us. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her. Well, a real gentleman here, so fifth act of kindness. Verse 15, And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. So she doesn't have to glean at the corners, brethren. Let her glean right among the sheaves. That's the sixth act of kindness. What is more, seventh act of kindness, verse 16, Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it day that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Chapter 3, verse 11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I'll do for you all that you request. Eighth act of kindness. Verse 14. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Well, that is ninth act of kindness, protection of her reputation. And verse 15. He measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. He gave her a special gift of food and groceries, so to speak, to go home with. Well, the little acts of kindness, brethren. It is the little things that count a lot in marriage, I guess, and not just the big. We'll come now to chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. 
So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. Now, brethren, the authoritative tone of voice here reveals the influential position held by Boaz, whom the Jewish commentators believe to have been a judge at this time. Now, remember that this was a period of, of the judges, not just big judges, such as we have in the book of Judges. There were also little judges, and Boaz was the judge in Bethlehem. Lower rank judge in Bethlehem. But notice, if you would, the name of the kinsman. Brethren, we got the name of everyone else in the book, but not the name of the nearer kinsman. In King James Version, it says that Boaz, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. Such a one. How would you like to be called such a one? Oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Such a One. How are you? Strange people, brethren. He is such a one. He, what a weirdo. Why is his name, his true name, left out? Well, the name was deliberately left blank in the Bible because this man wanted to make a name for himself, brethren. And because of his self selfishness and wanting to make a name for himself, his name is not recorded in the book that he would most like to have had it recorded in the book of books, the Bible. And we will see why as we go on. But before we go on, just to remind you, there are six major characters in the book, three of them selfish and three of them unselfish. Elimelech is a major character, selfish. Orpha is a major character at the beginning, selfish too. She wanted to go back to the world. Now, we can understand why she did, but as we, as I pointed out, brethren, she is sadly a representative of those that come so close to getting into the church of God and turn their backs on it and don't make it in. Part of the many that are called, but the few that are chosen. And the reason they go back into the world is generally plain selfishness. They want what is out there. They don't want to make the sacrifices for God. And yet, in making the sacrifices for God, brethren, they are going to get great blessings. And the third selfish character is this kinsman. Such a one. So three unselfish characters are, of course, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. So it is a contrast here as we go through story. Three that were selfish and three that were unselfish. And the three that were unselfish in the end got the greatest blessings because of what they were willing to give up. Verse 2. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Again, we notice that this was a man of authority. And then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And immediately, just as Naomi had heard the wedding bells, you know, dinging in her ears, this man saw the cash register dinging in his ears and heard it, you know, heard it ringing up. And, and he said, I'll redeem it. So, you know, see, it would seem, brethren, at first, that he believed that the land belonged solely to Naomi and that his duty would end with the purchase of the field from her. So, hence, his initial eagerness. However, so he said, you know, sure, I'll take it. Grab, grab, you know. Then Boaz dropped the bomb. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the land from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. In other words, brethren, the property would not be in the kinsman's name, but in the name of the widow he would marry, in the name of her former husband, which was Mahlon. Verse 6, And the close relative said, 
I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. Well, you see, brethren, his own firstborn son would not have been able to inherit that land. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, brethren, there is something else we need to understand here, which we certainly would not understand unless we knew some things about the Jewish culture of that time. We need to understand here that what the laws of Israel were and what exactly was going on here, brethren. To ruin his own inheritance meant he would cause a taint in the family pedigree. Now, when I said that, that obviously doesn't make any sense to you, but each man wanted to maintain his genealogy because they knew that the Messiah was to come from one of the descendants of Phares. And Boaz and Elimelech and his kinsmen were descendants of the line of Phares. And of course the Messiah was to come from that line. They knew this. So each man wanted to maintain his genealogy in his mind and keep it pure because they figured the Messiah could only come through a pure genealogy. Well, man, human reasoning, brethren, they couldn't have been wrong, more wrong than that, which we'll see in a minute. So if this kinsman, this nearer kinsman, the nearest kinsman, if he married a Gentile, that in his mind would taint his genealogy, and so he would not have a chance of being one of those part of the line that might give birth to the Messiah. So they figured it, you know, it could only come from the pure lines, so they wanted to keep the genealogy clean, under quotation mark, clean. A wrong attitude here, brethren, an attitude of selfishness. This man was in his mind the one from whom Jesus Christ could have come. So he didn't know the name of Jesus Christ, of course, the name of Jesus Christ, but that the Messiah could come from that line, from the promised line. And that's what he knew. And he was of that promised line, you know, of the line of Phares. But because he was selfish, notice, brethren, it, it was overturned to Boaz. And the man that had tried to preserve his pedigree lost out on the Messiah being born of his genealogy. Now Boaz, who was willing to give it up out of love for a proselyte in Israel, was the one through whom the Messiah did eventually come. And yes, there were many descendants to the line of Phares, and they knew the Messiah was going to come from one of those lines. So there was a big thing, brethren, to keep their line pure. Faulty human reasoning always gets in the way of serving God. And as you know, our thoughts are not God's thoughts, and our ways are not God's ways. So anyway, verse 7. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Mahlon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from position, his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And then, brethren, a very interesting prophetic statement by the people of Bethlehem in verse 11. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house, Ruth, like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And of course, Ben and Ruth was a part in building of the house of Israel, a Gentile woman, because from her line came Jesus Christ, which too built the house of Israel. And yes, he is coming. As a glorified king of kings, he will take the throne of his father David and he shall rule forever. Yes, but in physical terms, in the flesh, he came from the line of Ruth. 
And they continue, May you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Very interesting prophetic statement. Perhaps God inspired what went on in their mouths here, and brethren, they did not fully understand the importance of what they were saying. And Boaz and Ruth certainly had become famous in Bethlehem because, of course, they were the ancestors of King David and of Jesus Christ. Verse 12. May your house be like the house of Paris, or Phares, whom Tamara bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Now, brethren, Tamara's, Tamara's situation was similar to Ruth, even though Tamara, as far as we can tell, was not a Gentile. But she had a situation where seed had to be raised up to her as a widow. And you might remember the story back in Genesis chapter 38. It wasn't being done. It was a sin not to be done. So what she did, she just... Uh, pretended to be a prostitute, who seduced Judah, her father-in-law, and out of that sexual intercourse came the twins, Phares and Zara, those of the, of the line of Judah who have the kingly, the kingly rights and they have the scepter in the house of Israel, brethren. And in our studies about the house of Israel, in our lessons about the house of Israel, we have, you might remember, we have well established that the Phares line became the royal line through David in the promised land. However, Zara had exactly the same right to be king, but it was never actually fulfilled in the promised land. But Zara went with the lost wandering tribes of Israel and established a royal dynasty in the place where lost Israelites were, were dwelling on the British Isles. Amazing history, brilliant history. The key of David mentioned to Philadelphia Church in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. So anyway, Tamara's situation was similar, not exactly the same. She wasn't a Gentile, nevertheless. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Brethren, did you notice the Lord gave her conception? We noticed earlier when it said that Ruth happened to come to the field of Boaz, she really didn't happen to go there just by a chance. God was directing her to that place. And it was God who gave her conception here. Remember, she would have died childless because God had not permitted Mahlon and Chilion to beget sons or daughters. God had either made both of them impotent or he had sealed up the wombs of the two women, Orpha and Ruth. It was God, brethren. It was a divine intervention here which had enabled her to have children by the elderly Boaz and not by the young Mahlon. Verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. The actual word in the Hebrew for a close relative is Gaal which means Redeemer. Redeemer and the Redeemer here is not Boaz but the newborn son Because why because brethren he removed the stigma of childlessness from Ruth Because back then if you were bound and you had no children it was considered a stigma Should not have been of course, but it was and the Jews particularly considered it a curse from God Verse 15 and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has born him. Well, Ben, a lot of times when a man gets married, he wants to have a son, and that is okay, but it most certainly should not be to the exclusion of daughters. When two get married, they should both want daughters really as much as they want sons. Many men want sons because they want them to carry on their name. But of course, Brendan, we understand that we are a part of a spiritual household, and it is going to be a totally different situation for us as spirit beings, as the first fruits of God's salvation. But a daughter who loves you is better than seven sons. So, you know, fathers should respect their daughters as much as they do their sons. Daughters need as much their fathers as the sons do. If girls, as they grow, are neglected by their fathers, they tend to become, actually we, can, we have seen it all in our culture, they tend to become sexually loose. They tend to desire the attention of men, brethren. And if they don't get the proper fatherly attention from their fathers, they tend to crave it from young guys in the world. If there is a properly fatherly concern, then the chances are that girls are not as predisposed to be sexually loose. 
Now, I'm not talking about a one-time mistake some young women can make. I'm talking about girls that are boy-hungry in this world. And as I said to you, when it comes to sex matters, we are to be very open and blunt, especially for our younger generations, that they would, that they would not fall into Satan's clutches. Because there is one universal sin which applies without any discrimination to all races and all nations and all continents, brethren, and if there is one sphere of life when Satan has made such a mess, it's the sphere of sex. So we have to be clear with our young children. We need to educate them about things and give them proper examples. We must not allow shame to rule over and no, no way. We are not here Catholics. You know, God created marriage from the very start of the humankind. We are not to be like Catholics or anybody else regarding something that God created as shameful. We have no right to behave like that. And again, I said it yesterday. I said to you something yesterday, and I'll repeat it today on this day of the first fruits, brethren, because we are being judged right now. Unlike the world around us, the world is neither saved nor lost. We are not saved either. We are in the process of being saved because only if we endure to the end will be saved, as it says in Matthew 24 13. And because we are being judged, I'm going to tell you again. We must give proper education on sexual matters to our children, to our youth. If we don't do it, if we let the world educate, under quotation mark them, God is going to hold us responsible and we will be judged for that. There's been already enough damage in the church of God done by our shame and our covering up things because they're somewhat unpleasant and shameful. Really, what, what is unpleasant and shameful about things that God has created? There has been enough damage done in the Church of God, brethren, to our young people because of that. We don't want to be held responsible and we don't want to have part in Satan's work. We want to, as it says, we have to decry all the works of darkness, the works of Satan. So, when it comes to sexual things, we have to be very clear and instruct our young ladies and young gentlemen. But I've just what I've just mentioned here, yes, those girls who do not get proper father attention and care, they'll tend to become sexually loose. That's what it is. That's what psychology has proven. We have to be aware of that. Verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on his bosom and became a nurse to him. Verse 17. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi. <laughs> Interesting. Not born to Ruth. It was Ruth's son, of course. But it was born to Naomi, which is a nice way of looking at it, brethren. Because the stigma of childlessness was taken away from Naomi, not just from Ruth. And this was her redeemer, the young lad, that would be a nourisher of her old age. She was finally a grandmother. And they call his name Obed. Or in Hebrew, better trans uh, pronunciation is Ovid. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ovid, brethren, Obed, Ovid means a servant. He can mean also worker, but you know, workers always serve somebody. Well, Ovid, Ovid was, he was born to serve both men, both God actually and men. It is true that Naomi, of course, had sons. She was not childless in a sense that she was barren. Ruth was barren. But, you know, Naomi had lost her sons and they had been taken away by God's curse. <coughs> now, she was given a son again. This was a redeemer for her in her old age. So, Ovad was to be a servant to serve both God and man. Verse 18. Now, this is the genealogy of Ferris. Or far as far as we got Hezron, now we mentioned that the Messiah was to come from the line of Phares or Peres, as it says here in book in the book of Ruth, verse 19. Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, Nachshon, and Nachshon begot Salmon. Now this Nachshon is the prince of Judah, of whom we read in Numbers chapter one, verse twenty-one. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, or Obed. Now, brethren, Salmon, as far as we can tell, was the one who married Rahab the harlot. So, Tamara is also in the line of Jesus Christ, as we have mentioned. And, you know, that was something that came about by incest. 
And then Rahab the harlot, there was prostitution. And Jesus Christ's line, brethren, was not a pure line, as we can see. With two women that are in it, there was sexual impropriety. And one was Gentile, but she was a proselyte. So God was showing here that sex sins can be forgiven when people repent. And Jesus Christ came to bring about forgiveness of those sins and all sins. So Rahab, when she repented and brought about the giving up of that city to Joshua, she married Solomon. Verse 22, And Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. As we have mentioned, brethren, particularly in relation to verse 14, when he talks about the Redeemer, Ruth and Boaz are an Old Testament type of Mary and Joseph. They're also a type of the church and Jesus Christ. And Ovad, who was the Redeemer, was a type of Jesus Christ himself. Hence his name, Servant, because Jesus Christ came to be a servant to all humankind. And we as the first fruits, brethren, will be servants to all humankind with him. In this way, I hope we have redeemed ourselves from never quoting the book of Ruth in our messages. And uh, have a happy and great remaining day of the first fruits, the feast of first fruits. Happy Pentecost, brethren. And the lessons of the book of Ruth, may they be with us throughout the year. And may we remember again, Ruth is a prototype of us, the first fruits of salvation. Boaz was a top prototype of Jesus Christ. May the lessons remain with us and may we continue to remember and understand what we are being taught richly in this small book that we rarely, if ever, quote in our teachings.